born in 1922, which makes me 82 years old, and up in the Ozarks uh, in Missouri. And uh, I was in school, 19, just about like you are. I had just finished my freshman year, freshman year in uh, Southwest Missouri State in Springfield, Missouri. And as you well remember, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and threw us into a war. And I was not a student too long until they came through and said we needed help. And it was uh, most of the boys at that time taken into the service. You either volunteered or they would draft you. So I volunteered in the spring, 19-year-old, uh, for the Navy V-5 program, which uh, put me in the Navy flight school, did my training, some of it at the Missouri State, then they sent me west to St. Mary's University, finished uh, ground school in Corpus Christi. Nine months later, I graduated as a naval aviator uh, and as ensign, an ensign and the uh, Marine Corps had asked for some volunteers, so I volunteered as a fighter pilot, U.S. Marine Corps, uh, at 1942, and went to the South Pacific. I was in the Marine Corps four years and eight months, and I came out as a captain. So you got out in 1946? You got out? Of 45. The 45, yeah. you got out? 45. What did you do after the war? I uh, went back to school at most GI did. I went to Spartan School of Aeronautics. Okay. Uh, and did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, I had already had a pretty good training in aviation, and I liked it, so I stayed in aviation. But being a fighter pilot, they were pretty cheap. Uh, the airlines were hiring transport pilots. So I went to Spartan School of Aeronautics and got an A&E. What is that? What's an A&E? Aircraft &E? and Engine Mechanics. Okay. Training. Okay. And uh, which put me uh, a notch ahead most pilots. I was hired by the United Airlines out of Chicago. I moved to Chicago, stayed there very briefly. I didn't like the area at all, didn't like the job less. So I went to South Texas and joined up with a pilot that I'd been in service with that had a flight school and a crop dusting business. So I stayed there six years. I bought the business and was doing great. And I had a young son at that time. I had gotten married and had a son who had polio. And a doctor said, you get out of the area, you're not going to raise your son. So that put me out to hunt another job. So I went with Plymouth Oil Company and while I was in uh, corporate aviation, one of the stops was Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I saw a new airplane sitting on the ramp and I went over to inquire about it. Short in the story, I was hired to fly the Havilland Dove for Warren Petroleum, uh, which put me in uh, corporate aviation in the oil company. So I went from Warren Petroleum was merged with Gulf Oil. The Gulf Oil was merged by Chevron, and I completed 38 years in aviation. Retired in 1979. So, so your career was in in flight. Yes. Your career so far? Spent 38 and years. Maybe. What, what brought you here to, to this area? <laughs> a farm. Uh, I lived in Tulsa, and if you are uh, familiar with the local area, the Illinois River is only a few miles from here. And while in Tulsa, I bought a little old hillside farm over there on the river, the most beautiful spot in Oklahoma. And uh, of course, got transferred out of Tulsa. That was too good. Got transferred to Houston and spent a little time in Pittsburgh, PA, Atlanta, Georgia, a few of the oil companies that ship you around. And we are, I was in Houston for the second time and facing retirement. At that time I was chief oil, uh, chief pilot for Gulf Oil. And uh, the merger with Chevron was just taking place. And uh, I was offered retirement. I, I stayed on another year. I was age 55, which was normal retirement. And uh, they asked me if I'd stay on another year, which I did. And we tried to go back to Tulsa and retire, and it just wasn't the same. So we wanted to be near the place on the Illinois River where my 
kids dearly loved it. So we moved to Siloam. I had a son in the meantime that had polio and he was uh, pretty well handicapped. And we come to the smaller place where he could drive a car and participate. Now when you called me, you said that um, the way you put it, and I don't know if you were, if you were uh, joking a little bit or not, but you said that, that your family uh, kept telling you, you saw the blurb in the paper about this, what we were doing, and uh, that your family kept telling you you should come, and so that, in, and so finally you called me, and that um, that sort of implied that maybe you were a little reluctant to come. That's, talk, that's true. About that is true. And I, so if so, if that's so, you were a little reluctant. Why? Why would you be reluctant to come? I feel uncomfortable talking about the war. Uh, but, uh, here, Why is that? Sixty well, sixty years has passed. Uh, uh, it's, it left its scars. When you take a person your age, expose them to what we were exposed to for over four years, you're a different person. And uh, when we came out, the, the hardest part of the war for me was the rehabilitation after the war to get back. Uh, you're com completely torn up. Uh, now, what do you mean by that, completely torn up? Well, uh, you weren't happy in the service or out. When I came out, I, I had four months uh, leave built up. I didn't have any time off while I was in the service. And at the end of the well, the war wasn't over, but we got shipped back and had four months leave and uh, went back to uh, Springfield, Missouri. And I met the uh, most beautiful little school teacher you ever saw, <laughs> SMS. And uh, I just didn't go back to the service. So I came out at that time. You said that you needed to be re rehabilitated. I now, I suppose for some men that means physically they got injuries in the war and they needed that sort of rehabilitation. Well, that, Are you also referring to sort of yes, psychological I am, rehabilitation? Yes, I am. I, I mentally it was all right, but it, it, to get back into a, a civilian life was quite an ordeal for most of us. Not only me, but for all of us. Yeah. I was not physically shot up, I don't. It was an ordeal, what, in the sense that in the military you're just given orders and told what to do and now you have to make your own decisions or it's an ordeal in that you just had a lot of things in your mind that the people you're working with didn't have in their mind. And what do you mean by that? Well, that's, 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 that's what I meant. Uh, you, no job and here I was about to take a wife and really all I was trained to do was fighter pilot and that put pressure on me. So I went back to Spartan school and I went to airlines and that didn't happen. I didn't, wasn't happy there. So I wound up in a crop dusting business down in South Texas, still flying. And uh, I spent uh, about four years, five years there, because I had a son and he had polio and I had to take him out, so that required another change. When you were flying the, um, the, duck, the dust cropper plane, is that it? Dust crop cropper? duster. Crop duster, sorry. Yes. The crop duster or the commercial airline. Did your mind ever drift back to the war? All the time. Still does. How, a question, a friend of mine, he was here a couple weeks ago, he was, he's a war vet, he served on Okinawa, and he asked other veterans how often they think of the war. And they have a lot of different answers. His response is he thinks of it every day. How would you respond to this question? How often does the war just sort of creep up in the back of your mind? Well, not that often anymore. Uh, I want to add real quick, I have the highest respect for the military. They gave me a career. Uh, I went in a boy, came out a man. Uh, the five years, or nearly five years that I spent there was very, very educational. I, uh, I can't say too much for the military. You said a minute ago, I asked you um, if you're on the, you know, the various commercial planes mm -hmm. and, you know, you're just cruising along and would thoughts from the war come to your mind? Um, and then you said, yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. What kind of thoughts? Well, the guy you served with mainly, or something going to trigger a thought on a, a flashback. What would be an example of a particular event that you might remember, or a particular person? Uh, an accident uh, would happen, would cause an injury, and uh, out of the, uh, there was 36 pilots that was in the squadron, and out of the 36, uh, there's only five of us left. 
And Five that came out of the war? Oh, uh, there's 12. Uh, no, there was uh, 15 came back from the war. We lost half, about half. And uh, in the meantime, most of those are gone. There's five of us left. And so five of 36 still living, do you, yes. you get together yes. with their? Well, we did get together, but uh, there's not enough of us now to do it, and most of them are uh, incapacitated. They can't travel too much. Uh, the, the first few squadrons uh, had the enlisted men as well as the uh, officers. Do you remember some of the names of the fellow pilots you know who didn't come back? Any of the names one mark? Oh yeah, there's lots of them. There's Smith, and there's a Jones, and there's a Jensen, and, and a Crabtree, and a, a Smucker. And these, are, these are fellows you knew? Uh-huh. Uh, the Smucker was a nephew of the people who knew Jams and Jellies. He was a nephew of that family, and uh, uh, he was killed. I like to, um, well, I don't know if I like to, but I try to have vets talk about fellows they know who didn't come back, mm -hmm. not to be morbid, but partly because the students here are the ages of the fellows you knew who didn't come yeah. back, mm -hmm. and I think it's valuable for them to see that people in their late teens, early twenties mm -hmm. can do this kind of thing, and then also just because I think it's a way to honor them. And so you mentioned Smith and Jones and Jensen, Crabtree and Smucker. Would you be willing to tell us something about one or a couple of these? Yeah, uh, uh, Beals was one of the first guys killed, the first guy that was killed. He, uh, Beals? Beals, George Beals. And he was a ministerial student and went in the service about like I did because at that time you either, if you didn't go join something, you'd be drafted. And uh, I did not meet George Beals until I got out of flight school, and he was a few months ahead of me. And we met in the squadron, and he was the first guy shot down overseas. Uh, I just took a dart. And Do you know what part of, where, what battle that was a part of, or? Yeah, it was uh, 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 I'm sorry, where? Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. Uh, yeah, and, and off Hempson Field. How old was he? He was probably 21 at the time. Um, what comes to mind, you mentioned a fellow named Jensen. Mm -hmm. Jensen is one of the, uh, well, he was a young Mormon boy. And uh, uh, that's just the looks of the guy. He was just personified teenager, very clean cut, very high morals. And uh, he was shot down on a strafing run. And uh, if fighter pilots, uh, normally when they're shot down, they're killed. But only a few of them survive. Some land in the water and are picked up. Uh, we were fighting a ruthless enemy. Uh, the Japanese uh, were very ruthless. Uh, we faced now with the suicide bombers in Iraq and so forth. That's nothing new. And the Japanese were the kamikazes. Did you, did you know that if, you, if your plane was shot down but you survived and you were taken captive, did you have an idea of what might happen if you were captive? Yes, I did. Uh, and what I didn't know be? what happened uh, to one of them. He was not injured severely and he was taken before the Japanese court and uh, the officers met and he was murdered and his stomach, was, his liver was taken out, and uh, his liver was served to the servicemen, the officers, the Japanese, and he thought that would make them stronger fighters. And we knew if we were shot down in the territory that we would probably not survive, which is true. What, what did, did, did the military tell you if, you if you're in this situation and you think it's likely to be captured? Just use your pistol and fight to the death. Fight your way out. Don't, there's it, no use in trying to surrender. Well, no, there wasn't. Uh, if you want to really know what happened, there's a book out uh, called Flyboys, and our first President Bush was shot down over Tiko Jima, which was outside of Iwo Jima. And uh, after the war, uh, and just last, just recently, there's a Jane Bradley had written a book and he took the
president back over and they relived and rehashed and it's all in that book mm -hmm. and uh, it that, was a, that was a big seller a couple years ago I think it, yes a year and a half ago yes, uh, um, just last question and then we'll and then last question about something you've already mentioned and then we'll go back to um, before the war and sort of walk through it uh, you mentioned another fellow named Crabtree yeah do you remember his first name John and what do you remember about him I remember he uh, shot down. Uh, he personally was not hit, but his airplane landed in the water. And uh, we were on a strike off of Yap Island. And uh, they usually had a seaplane offshore to pick up pilots that were shot down. Well, he was shot down. He landed in the water, got out in his rubber raft, and was afloat. Of course, the fighters were being heavy like they are. They don't float very long. But when I wasn't, he was in his life raft. And for some reason, he disappeared. And they assumed, uh, before the seaplane could get there, we, we uh, went ahead, flew off and came back and tried to circle, but he disappeared and they assumed that he lived and that they had uh, got in a shark bed or something and the sharks ate him. But he would disappear. How do you, uh, you know, how do you deal with this over time? Um, the first fellow is Beals. Is he's the first fellow you knew of the people you knew? He was the first one. Yes. And that was early on in the war. Was very early in the war. What's the difference between hearing about Beals and mm -hmm. then hearing about Crabtree? I mean, after a while, does it? Do you almost prepare yourself psychologically that, okay, there are, what, 15 of us now, uh, two hours from now, there's likely to be just 12? Well, now this happened over a period of a year, the losses. And so, is there a change in how you deal with it? I mean, was there a change in how you responded to the news about Beals and to how you responded to the news about Crabtree? No, I, I, I don't think there's any difference. Uh, how, how do you respond? Uh, well, you just live with it. You just don't forget out. it, but you live with it. And uh, we knew that each time we went out, we stood the same possibility. But uh, the biggest thing was to be a coward and say no, which on occasion you have. We had two pilots that just didn't muster. They just refused to go back home? Yes. So um, uh, they took their wings away from them, gave them a disarm, discharge, and sent them home. And I don't know what happened to them from there on. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Okay. What kind of plane did you fly? Well, I started out uh, flying uh, Wildcats, Grumman Wildcats, and that was in operational. And I went from that into the Corsair, which is the bent wing. And I shipboard also, so... Uh, Let's go, let's go back to any, any other questions about Jeff to join us. Any other questions? Let's go back to December 7, 41. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you doing when you heard the news? Do you remember? Yeah, playing softball. It was on Sunday afternoon. A group of neighborhood boys playing softball. And how did the news come to you? Didn't have any idea where Pearl Harbor was. Didn't have a clue. That's something we've heard a few times from the vets. Uh -huh. <coughs> no idea where this place was. And did you hear it on the radio, or did somebody run into somebody the game? Somebody went out and told us. Uh, that was the day the radios were scarce. Uh, there's a radio in the neighborhood, and they got the news, and it's scattered. How old were you? Nineteen. Eighteen when it happened. Eighteen in Pearl Harbor. Do you remember what the first thought was that you had? No, I really didn't. I, I don't. I, it didn't alarm me. That was a long way off. How long uh, was it after that when you knew that you were going to be part of it? I mean, because war is declared the next yeah. day, and yeah, as the uh, following year, in 1942. In 19, early in 1942. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how long is it between Pearl Harbor and the time you now you volunteer? Yes. Right, you volunteer? Yes. I was, I was a student, just like these guys. Right. Uh, so, how much time is there between? Oh, I've gone about a year. About a year. Yeah. So late 42. Yeah. You volunteer to go in. Um. Were people asking you, uh, let me, let me uh, what I'm getting at is, did that year, 
feel a little awkward? Yes, were, were people saying, hey, uh, there's a war on, why aren't you well, in the Army? Or <coughs> they didn't have to tell you because uh, uh, they were disappearing all around it. Uh, your neighbors, and your friends, the students. Did you know, say, as of January 42, that you would go into the military? No, I didn't know at that You're time. hoping? I just went in school. Mm -hmm. At that time, they were giving deferments for students. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, what caused you to decide to join up? I, I think because everybody else was. It was a thing to do. Right. Was there also, was it mainly that, that, you know, I don't want to be the only young guy out here that's... Well, I, you know, I'd like to say I waved the flag and I was so patriotic, but I, I don't believe it. I believe it's just the fact all my friends were leaving, and uh, that was a way to get off the farm. So there's almost a sense of sort of social pressure in a way. Right, right. Okay, you join, so then, so you go to basic where? Uh, well, I finished uh, a few classes in Springfield at SMS, and then they sent me to St. Mary's University there in California for ground school. And I went to Little Michael Primer and then Corpus Christi for that. Yeah. What made you decide to go for being a pilot? To be a pilot? Yeah, rather than artillery officer well, or something <laughs> else. I just saw airplanes going by and I didn't want I didn't want to be on ground troops. I knew that. Called them ground pounders and I didn't want any part of that. Because at what as dangerous as the flight is as dangerous as the mission yeah. is, you still go back yeah. to relatively comfortable yeah. barracks. Yeah, a lot of my group went into the uh, uh, Air Force, U.S. Air Force. But the, at the time, the Navy was offering a $500 a year bonus for Navy pilots due to the operation off the ship. They figured it was more hazardous and it was worth $500 a year more. So that put me in the Navy. And uh, I wanted to be a Marine. I got my wings in the Navy, and by golly, the chance came up, and I gave it a shot, and they took me. So I'm still a Marine. Did the Marine Corps then have this sense of this feeling of identity Absolutely. that it does now? Yes. So that's interesting. You go from a position where you know you'd really just like to stay in school, uh, but there's sort of the peer pressure, and so you go in the military. Uh, but then something happens that not only do you want to be in the military, but you want to be in the most gung-ho, sort of in-your-face branch of the military. What accounts for that change? Well, I, if I'd stayed in the Navy, I'd, the possibility I'd been kept as an instructor. They were, uh, early days of the war, we had to start from scratch. You could, first of all, you got to have instructors to start teaching, and they were taking a certain group of the Navy pilots for instructors, and others to fly P-boats, and others to fly other things. I wanted to fly fighters, and I thought that was my best route. Now you wanted to fly, you said you wanted to fly fighters, you didn't want to fly plane. I mean uh, supply planes, or no, you didn't want to? No. So you wanted, so, I mean, this is a transition, you go from sort of, I'm in school and I'd rather maybe not get involved, and now you're in, now you're in the most aggressive branch, now you're actually in the fighter planes. Right. And so that's an interesting Well, the Navy transition. too, that $500 a year, that was pretty good. <laughs> Considering your salary was two hundred dollars a month, at five hundred dollars a year was a pretty good bonus. So the so the extra money's the lure. Did you also were you also eager though to get into the get into the fight? Yes, first day or two. <laughs> yeah. What did you? Uh, what sort of image did you have in your mind about what air combat would be like? before you actually experienced it? Well, we pretty it. well knew they had film, and, uh, and uh, they'd been some Navy battles, and uh, Guadalcanal, that probably doesn't mean a thing to you. But Can you tell us a little bit about that, why it was an important battle? Yes. Uh, we have a map up here, too, if, you, if you'd like to use it. Well, the Japanese were winning the war. They'd gone all the way through the Pacific. We were losing the war, let's face it, even here in, in Europe. And Guadalcanal was the place where they stopped them, turned them around. And from there on, it was island after island, all the way back to the Philippines and to Okinawa, to where they could strike the homeland with bombers. Right. So it was just island hopping from 
Well, they, the Japanese actually got on Australia. They got on the uh, northern tip of Australia. Yeah. But the but uh, Guadalcanal was the first real battle, real stopping spot. And from there on, it was. So the Allied strategy in the Pacific was to sort of, uh, it doesn't show on this map, but to basically to take one island at a time, getting closer and closer to Japan, That's right. build air bases and make it easier. To yeah. Did you ever fly any, how close did you get to Japan itself? Well, I stopped at Peleliu, and uh, for me the war was over there. They took Peleliu in order to have a better shot at the Philippines. Okay. And from the Philippines, they were able to move on. Now, when you just said for you the war was over, was that because you the flew a certain number of missions? And well, then it, it was tours of duty. You were over there so long. Sometimes your mission was five minutes, sometimes two hours. So you stayed for tours of duty. So mine was over, and uh, I got to come back. Okay. That was 1945. I was home when the Japanese surrendered. Okay. I was out of the service. Um, just a couple more questions, then we'll take a short break, and then we'll come back. Um, let's go to, uh, let's say, um, right before you head into your first engagement, where you know you know that you're going to meet the enemy. Um, and I guess you probably gather with the other pilots and have a briefing of some kind? Oh, yeah, you had a briefing, sure. You knew what you got going to do. What's the environment like? Say, I don't know, do you, you know, can you... Like, can you summarize, say, the two hours leading up to actually taking off for the first well, that's probably the worst part of the mission, is the uh, briefing and sitting there waiting, like a loaded gun. Uh, that is the worst part of it. It's kind of an obvious question, but, we'll, you know, what makes it the worst part? Just the anticipation, just sitting there, wanting to go and just... Wanting to go just to alleviate the pressure? Yes. Just to get you board. felt more comfortable in that airplane and uh, doing your own thing than you did sitting back there being briefed. Of course, it depends on where you're on a ship or on land. Uh, briefings are about the same. Um, now, while you're being briefed, of course, you have somebody talking to you, but you have, must have other times where you're with the other pilots. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just sort of waiting. Yeah, I can bear. Especially that first time. Was there much conversation? No, not a whole lot. It's pretty quiet. Pretty quiet. How would, how would you describe the feeling? Oh, most most of them just took what through and kept quiet. And I can only tell you what I was doing. And I was I was praying. <laughs> and I think most of those guys were. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you remember what kind of things you'd say in your prayers? Absolutely. Oh, you Lord, here I am. And, and protect me, and uh, forgive me. It, it's not a, it's not a great thing to know you're going out and shoot somebody. Uh, you have to think twice for the first few times you do it. Uh, of course, that's your mission. Uh, our mission and the Marine Corps, particularly our squadron, was to support landings. Uh, the ground troops would come off of the uh, landing craft and into the shore. And you strafe the shore or the airport or whatever you could. Uh, so to try to get the Japanese defenses? You would try to take out the Japanese defenses? Yes. So those, those uh, ground troops, those ground marines, they were depending on you. And they uh, took all you got sometime, but you just hold your neck and went in. So you said you'd say you'd pray for protection, but you'd also pray for forgiveness? Yeah, you knew you were going to kill somebody. So that, so, was that kind of abstract for you, or, or did you feel bad? I mean, this is your duty, it's your job, we get the war over, but you also felt bad about it at the same no, time? No, I didn't feel bad about it at all. I'd have done it in a minute. Uh, I'd have dropped the, I would have dropped the A-bomb if I had the occasion. I tell you, you you get pretty hardened when you get shot at, and you know they're out to kill you. Now this is a hard thing to discuss. This this you know 
I don't know that I've ever discussed it before in the group. Uh, my kids knew that I was in the service. They knew that I'd overseas, but they never knew what I did. In fact, they'd be, if they were sitting in here, they'd learn things. Never talked about it. Do you think it's important, I mean, this is something that's been happening, uh, especially, I think, for the past 10 years. And I think uh, the work of Stephen Ambrose, do you know who that, you know that name? He's the author. Of, and also the movie Saving Private Ryan. I think it's sort of made a lot of people realize that in World War II, you know, it's important to talk to the vets. Do you think that, and this kind of thing is happening all over yeah. the place now. Do you think it's important, though, for young people to know about the war, not only from books, but from the people, you know, you said of the 36, there are, there are just five left, to learn from the people who were there um, while they can? Well, I, th I think so. Now, the World War II GIs, three out of every four is already gone, and they're dying at the rate of 1,800 a day. So uh, if we're going to tell our story, we've got to get it told. I'm 82, and I was one of the young ones. Uh, just, I know in my neighborhood I lost six here last year, my friends. So uh, it's, uh, they're fast disappearing. So if I could be of any help, that's the reason I'm here today. I've, I've never done this before, but if I can say something or to encourage, do a little bit of good, now's the time to do it. If you've got your story, tell it. That's what my kids tell me, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> I have one more question. Does anybody have a question before we take a break? I mean, I have another question, then we'll take a short break, yeah. and then we'll come back. Um, I'm always interested in that little window of time when a person in combat goes from a position of safety to danger. So, for example, you're in the foxhole, you go out of the foxhole, and now mm -hmm. here come the bullets. Do you remember what that, um, do you remember the first instance, like you said, you know, when people are shooting at you, mm -hmm. you know, you become hardened. Do you remember the first time that the plane you were in uh, came under fire? Well, and I, I really don't. I, there were holes in the airplane. That's the only reason I knew it. Uh, of course, you could see, sometimes you can smell the fire. It got that, it got that heavy. Uh, they had proximity shells, and uh, you'd go in maybe at, of course, normally you were low over the water. If you got a little altitude, they'd shoot a shell that had proximity and it burst, you know, and, and uh, uh, you get the, the, the disadvantage of being shot at by several hundred little pieces, yeah. and you can smell it. And uh, I remember that very distinctly, that smell of that burned powder. Huh. But I never thought ever that I was going to get shot down. It never, I just, uh, just didn't think that. Did you... Did you ever see any other American planes that you were with on a mission go down? Oh, yeah. That was not uncommon at all. But you just feel sorry for them and keep going. Yeah. But even though you saw that, you know, sometimes veterans say they have this sense of invincibility, it won't happen to me. And then time goes by, mm -hmm. well, maybe it will happen to me. And then more time goes by, well, it's just a matter of time. And that, that process didn't happen to you? Not to me, time. you know. I believe in mental telepathy. Uh, grab it and go. Just give it the best you got. And uh, don't give up. That's the old Marine spirit. <laughs> they teach you that. And I, I believe it. When you see a young, a young guy in a Marine uniform today, do you have a special feeling? Sure do. When I see that flag, I do too. You ever go up to a young Marine and say anything? Well, I guess, thanks for serving. Okay. Any questions before I take a short break? All right. It, uh, more so, yes. Uh, anytime you face danger, you're going <laughs> to, if you're smart, you're going to pray. <laughs> and uh, I did it uh, unashamedly, even in training. Well, Lord, help me get through this. Uh, and I want to throw in a uh, thing or two right now. If you're asked to serve, go in and <coughs> give it your level best. Go to the best. They have the best schools in the world. I don't care in what area you go in. They're the very best. And we have so many guys go in and don't take advantage of it. They want to go in as a guard or as something. 
we go in and, uh, which is computers or aviation or, uh, I had a friend that was uh, out in Long Beach the other day and they brought an atomic submarine in and there was representatives from these companies. As soon as those sailors come off of that atomic submarine, they try to hire them. Those guys are so well trained and they have so much knowledge that the industry wants them. Now, when I came out, there's so many pilots that there just weren't enough airlines to go around. But as it thinned out, a lot of people didn't want to fly anymore. And uh, I went into the crop dusting. Now, rather, rather than go airline, I went into the corporate world. And it was, it was very good to me. In the war, do you remember chaplains being much of a presence? Not where I was. Now, there's one on ship all the time. But uh, I did not see one when I was land-based. So, when you were getting ready for a mission, there, so far as you remember, there wouldn't be a chaplain around. Just, do you want to talk before you no. before you head out? No. Um, any sort of impromptu services or no? You know, when fellows get together. So even if there was a lot of prayer, it was very individual, very much, and very internal. Yeah. yeah. Um. What did you think about, now, I, I'm, did you ever get into dog fights in the air? No, my job was landing support. Okay. So, whatever's coming at you is coming from the ground? Well, not necessarily. I'm shot at from other fighters. Okay, from Japanese fighters. Yeah, but uh, the, see, the Marine Corps was uh, supporting the landings, and the Navy was taking the aerial, so they were uh, used to taking care of the Japanese aviation while we were for the landing. You said, do you want to ask Yeah. Were you, did you ever fly off aircraft carriers? Yes. Yes, I did. Actually. Did you ever fly off just uh, the ground? Yes. Land, base, and sea base, and carry base both. Uh -huh. Was your carrier ever attacked? Yes. yes. And did you have to scramble? <laughs> yes. Which carrier was it? Well, I was on the Enterprise for a while, and Rudyard Bay, and the Coagula, and I was on three different ones. The Roger Bay and the Quadrant were Jeep carriers. They were used mostly for carrying Marines uh, landing support. Can you can you sort of walk us through that? Let's say you're on the ship, and I imagine it's quiet, and then General Quarters goes, mm -hmm. and then a battle ensues, mm -hmm. and then oh, sometime later the battle's over. Right? Um, just the first one that comes to your mind, General Quarters. Off you go. And now right. we're in the battle. Can you just sort of walk us through that? Yeah, we're assigned. Uh, if, if you were to make the scramble, you knew it. Uh, you knew it. That you had uh, a lot more pilots than you had airplanes. So you weren't all in the air at one time. So you usually assigned a certain period of time. You had to scramble. You may not be on that. So. Yeah, did you have to scramble when the ship was actually under attack? Mm -hmm. At times, yes. Do you even think at all, or is it just all training? Uh, you react to training, uh, about 100%. Uh, your reaction just follows what you've been taught. And uh, it isn't that bad. I don't want to make it sound that bad. It, uh, certain parts of it's enjoyable. What certain parts of what? Well, R&R. Uh, &R, I got to Australia twice. and. Uh, I was in Kelly Lou at the time. <laughs> you got uh, two weeks R and R. Well, you couldn't come home, so you were on the island, and you had the best way you could to go where you could. And I wanted to go to Australia, so I kept transport to come in. Where are you going, buddy? And he'd go to an island. Well, that's a little closer. So uh, you got to Australia, stayed a day or two, and then you had to worry about getting back. <laughs> oh, so that's how you spent for two weeks? Sometimes or, it did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in transit. Was there ever a concern about whether the ship you were on was in good enough shape to land on again? To come back to? And was that well, yeah, yeah, that was always a concern. I was more land-based than, than carrier-based, however. Okay. But there's always, uh, always a possibility that you come home and be a hole in a runway or something. And, uh, and what would you do in that case? Just bail out? No. No, you just landed the best you could. 
Okay. When you bailed out, that airplane was gone. You had you didn't want that to happen at all. Save that airplane. Okay. Any other questions? You said um, a little while back that you would pray for forgiveness because you knew that you you'd um, kill people that day. <coughs> Uh, but then you said a couple minutes later that if if you could have if you had the opportunity to drop the A bomb you would have. Yes. Um, so the question is how and that's that's very common. I mean you know that's there's nothing unique. I mean from what the vets say there's just that sense, especially in the Pacific War. Um, what did you think about the enemy at all? I mean how would you what sort of words at the time if somebody said well you know. Who are those people that you're fighting? What kind of words would you have used, say, in 1940, early 43? Well, you knew what they were. They were ruthless uh, killers. Uh, they had no morals. Uh, they were the kamikazes. You know, they were, this is nothing new. Uh, the war they're fighting now, where they give their life to kill somebody else. The kamikaze, he would uh, take his airplane, dive into anything he could. Did you ever see kamikazes in action? Yes, and uh, they would, uh, in one case, uh, no, I had a friend named Sam, uh, I'll call him Sam, and later they called him Sad Sam. He was shot, the airplane was shot down, he bailed out, and a Japanese buzzed him, cut his legs off the, with the propeller. And things like that happened. And we knew if we were shot down and landed amongst the Japanese, that our chances for survival were very, very, very thin. Do you think when the average soldier in the Pacific, or the you know the combatant in the Pacific, is thinking about getting the Japanese, it has to do with getting the war over, right? The more of them we knock out of the way, the sooner the war is over. Mm -hmm. And that's how soldiers in Europe, who fought in Europe, talked. I didn't, you know, really, I didn't really like killing them, although some said we didn't mind it. But the more of them we took out, we knew the closer we were to getting home. Was that true in the Pacific? Uh, mainly, or would you say mainly, was there also the revenge factor? They hit us in Pearl Harbor, and now this is, uh, this is it's about winning the war, but it's also revenge time. Well, you bring it down to a day to day. Uh, got Pearl Harbor, they got the next mission. And uh, it was just an idea we out there so long, you had to have so many. Ours was a tour of duty. You'd say it would serve about six months on and give you a week or two off, and then you go back for six more. And the mission, some missions were five minutes and some were five hours. Uh, on a, We land on Peleliu. They owned one end of the runway and we owned the other. And uh, you'd, you'd start your strafing run when you started your takeoff. And of course they were shooting at you at the same time. And uh, you were carrying napalm bombs. So you go up and make you run, drop your bomb, come back and land on the, and land short, break it. And, uh, but that was just a mission. That was load up and go again. Did you feel you said you would do support runs when the Marines were charging the beaches? Yes. Did you feel fortunate in that? Well, I'm I'm strafing these guys and I'm in a little danger, but I'm a lot less danger oh, than those guys in yeah. the beach. Yeah, I, I I felt much safer. <laughs> Much better off. Could you ever see as you were flying over what kind of trouble the Marines were in down there? Well, sure, you could see that. Uh, definitely. Uh, you could see the landing craft uh, that uh, didn't make it to shore. And, uh, what would happen to them? Well, they, and the water. Some of them were picked up, some weren't. Uh, here's, I, I hate to inject this now, but there's been a few over 1,000 deaths in this present battle that we're fighting. In the Battle of Iwo Jima, there was 5,000 before they ever got on shore. Uh, it's, it's just completely different. Uh, when a guy gets killed and, uh, well, you know it, just pictures in the paper and tell all that. In World War II, they killed him in the thousands, and uh, it was just that way. Uh, What's changed that a thousand now seems like a lot of men, and obviously it's a thousand lives and a thousand families, but it seems like a high number to, you know, people my age and younger, oh, we've lost a thousand. 
But in a single, as you say, in a single battle in World War II, uh, the U.S. would lose, you know, 5,000, you say, before yeah. they even hit the beach. What's changed in American society that there's press. such a low tolerance? The press. I think it's what do you mean by that? Well, they, uh, somebody shot, they put a picture of paper, sent it home, and all of that. That was unheard of in World War II. You went to war, and, and uh, you stayed. And you stayed till it's over, and they sent you home. And I don't, we only had a couple of turncoats that I know about. They were two pilots that just didn't, just couldn't cut it. So they discharged them and sent them home. We had a veteran here a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, who said that if the television cameras had been around in the Second World War, that the public would have tolerated it. Do you agree with that? I expect that's true, yes. Yes. Were you tempted to uh, volunteer to fight in Vietnam? I mean, I'm sorry, in Korea? No. Enough's enough? No, well, uh, the war had passed me, an old fighter pilot. That, I was too old for that. How old were you when you got out? How old were they? When you got out of the, of the Marines? All together, I was 25, 24, 5. Uh, so when Korea starts, you were 30? About 30, yeah, 31? 30, yeah, now part of the guys that was in, I came out of the reserve. Part of them stayed in the reserves and I had to go back in. Okay. So to be 30, though, that's still too old to well, be a, a fighter, fighter pilot. pilot uh, that's getting pretty old for fighter pilots. Fighter pilots and football players. <laughs> well, you, uh, see, the old planes were not pressured. Uh, now, that type of doesn't mean anything to you, but the modern airplane are pressured. You're fighting at a, uh, an atmosphere here. but. Uh, Back then, they weren't. Uh, sometimes we were in dives, and you'd go from 10, 12,000 foot down to sea level. That's hard on the body. It's hard on the ears. Hard on everything. It was much, much tougher then than it is now. The pressure airplanes and the jets. Uh, I went through from the biplane through jets. The last airplane I flew was a four-inch jet. So I covered the scope of aviation, and uh, it becomes easier and easier. So. In, in a course of a battle, you're getting shot at. You've got to do these maneuvers. Yeah. Uh, plus, your your body's dealing with all sorts of, you know, various pressures. And so, really, in a way, it, it just has to be training, doesn't it? Yeah, you react to training. Yeah. That's it. Uh, a Navy aviator, which is part of the Marine Corps, Marine Corps, part of the Navy, but it's different than the Air Force. First of all, you go out and do battle, you got to find your home if you're on a carrier. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes that's not easy. Uh, a Navy aviator has to be much better trained than an Air Force pilot. To find that carrier? That's part of it, but yeah. to land on the carrier too. Yeah. Uh, to take a jet airplane and land it on a carrier is no simple track. It, it, it takes a little yeah. takes some practice. Yeah, I was in the Navy, I was on a carrier myself. Were you? And I never got tired of watching this. Mm -hmm. it's good. Debbie? Uh, you said at the beginning that coming out of the war was one of the hardest things, getting back into civilian life. Um, and I was wondering how you dealt with that. What, what you said is very, very true. When I came out of the service, I thought I'd go back in and finish my time, but 20 years to retirement. But uh, as I told you, I met this little school teacher. <laughs> And uh, I tried to go back to school. I wanted to become an engineer. And I'd had over a year, but I'd had a lot of the basics, math and physics, and that's the reason I got into aviation, uh, by not having more schooling. But uh, it was very, very difficult, the period after coming out of service for, and I, and I thank my poor wife for putting up with me. You have all kinds of feelings and and it, it uh, it's a very difficult time. To me, it was more difficult than going in the service and getting used to it. Yes. Um, Vietnam comes around, and by then you're, what, in your mid-40s then, mm -hmm. when Vietnam comes yes, around? Yes, I'm too old for that. Um, <laughs> what did you, 
you know, with all the protests and all that um, that happened in that war and all the problems related to that war, did you have any strong opinions about sure that? Sure did. Uh, we were sent over there to fight and to treat the poor guys that went over and did their very best, lost so many uh, that were not received back home. That was just very, very difficult. Uh, we were received as heroes in World War II. And, uh, but the thing that I get now, after we came out of World War II for a couple of years there, it was completely unsettled. He's trying to get back everything, get back from the factories, get back to making goods. So, uh, but then for about 60 years, we heard nothing as a veteran. We were, it was not talked about. It was not, maybe so in school or something, but. Sort of forgotten. This I was never asked until just recently to come to a group like this. Uh, what? Why is that? Do you think? I don't know. And personally, I didn't know what to expect. I was asked <laughs> just recently to go down to primary school for the second graders <laughs> to go talk to them about the war. Yes. The, uh, the teacher. What, what asked, were you, have you done that already? Yes. And what did you say to them? Well. Uh, I just told them I flew airplanes. Leave <laughs> uh, uh, out the details. None of the details, of course. Uh, they had lots and lots of questions. Uh, were you scared? And the uh, first question was, uh, who shot at you? And did they intend to hit you? And all of this. <laughs> and after, were they just playing? After uh, the class, oh, it lasted about four or five minutes an hour. And later on, I got a letter from each student in that class, uh, their reaction. <laughs> One little boy said, I'm glad you rode a jet. <laughs> well, of course, jets were on Earth when I was in service. <laughs> <laughs> but you, some of you may be asked to serve, and I hope that if you are, you will. It's not that bad. Uh, best schools in the world, and you'll be the best trained in the world. And uh, there's a lot of pluses. It gave me a career. I had a very good career in aviation. It lasted 38 years. And uh, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. I tried to go back to college after it was over, but I spent four years, eight months in there. And uh, I just couldn't. I just couldn't make myself study. I was already quick to fly airplanes and I went back and got an A and A, which is mechanic training, which put me a notch above the average fighter pilot and quite a few notches above some of the pilots that knew nothing knew nothing about mechanics. So I went to fly for these oil companies. And uh, worked out real well. I retired as the chief pilot in Gulf Oil. And uh, anybody have a question? Uh, let me just ask two more. Uh, if you um, wanted, you know, young folks uh, who are the age now they were when you went in the service, if you want them to know one thing about the war in the Pacific, uh, what would it be? About the war in the Pacific, it was long and drawn out, and it covered millions of square miles, and there was an awful lot of servicemen lost out there. And uh, we were asked, our squadron, Squadron 121, uh, was asked to go back to Pelilu on the 50th anniversary. The Japanese invited us back. Uh, that's where the Isle of Pelilu, where the most people lost per square foot of any battle ever fought in history. And the Japanese took a thorough beating. And uh, I don't know why they invited us back. I wouldn't go. I did not go. Uh, two or three of the pilots and several of the servicemen went back, and they were treated royally by the Japanese on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Pelilu. And that was my last engagement. I came home after that. And then lastly, uh, just to go back to something we started out with, you mentioned, you mentioned several names, George Beals, Smith, do you remember his first name? Jesse, they called him. I, 
I guess it was Jeff. How about Jones? Jones? First name? Eli. Eli? Yeah. He was a little Eli Jones. How about Jensen? Lehi. L-E-H-I. Eli and Lehi. Uh -huh. Jensen. John Crabtree and Smucker? Mm-hmm. Uh, I see Glenn. Glenn Smucker. Any others that you can remember? Well, I, I'd have to do a little thought. Yeah, it was uh, right off that. Of these, of Beal, Smith, Jones, Jensen, Crabtree, Smucker, which one uh, has come to your mind the most since the war? George Beale, probably the first one he was a minister of student, and uh, the way he was lost. Uh, we made a strafing run on the island of Yap, and his airplane was hit, and he landed in the water. He didn't have to bail out, he could land in the water. Got out on the wing of the airplane, got in his little dinghy, and was floating. It was pretty rough seas, and the seaplane was off probably 20 miles. And uh, we saw him go down, and we went back out in a circle. And when the seaplane got there, the waves, from the, he disappeared. So that, I've thought of that many, many times. Just the mystery of it. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then there's a Brown. Brown. Uh, he lives in Florida now, and he was shot down over Target and bailed out. Now this was on the island of Babblethorpe, and uh, there was a big gun emplacement, and he was, we were strafing the gun emplacement, and he got shot and bailed out right over Target, and he pulled his, ripped his chute and got out 100 yards in the water, and we were circling to protect him from the ground. And uh, his left, or his right leg, was pretty well mangled and shot up. 